Today, our topic of discussion is on the sources of ancient Indian history. Why the study of the history of ancient India should begin with a discussion on sources. Why sources are so important for the historian. Now we have to remember that the subject matter of history concerns past. It can be a remote past, very ancient past, it can also be a recent past. The historian looks at the past from his or her position at the present. For the present times, the developments, the happenings, the incidents are reported almost instantaneously by electronic media, by television, by newspapers. The analysis of news in newspapers, in radio. What happens if the situation is of a relatively longer past and if particularly of a very remote past when the historian was definitely not present at the time the events or the developments or the situations of the past are being studied. One has to look for some kind of evidence. The understanding of the past is important because what we observe at this moment at present is in fact the result of the accumulation of many events and many experiences that had happened in the past. And the understanding of the historical past is often dependent upon some kind of evidence which is available to the historian of the present. What is an authentic information? What is not an authentic information? How to judge it? This requires a very special type of professional skill with which the historian must be thoroughly acquainted and fully capable of utilizing those skills. That's why the information and the sources of information is so crucial for the understanding of the past. The remoter the past, greater is the importance of finding out the sources of information about the past. Let us take an example. We all know in 1757 at the Battle of Plassey, the English East India Company defeated Nawab Siraj Dollah of Bengal and captured power. With that began a very major transformation in the history of India. When we talk about the Battle of Plassey, it is a, a past of relatively recent past and the documents of the happenings at the Battle of Plassey the situation arising out of the Battle of Plassey are so well recorded and so well ingrained in the memory of the later generations that one does not have to cite how did we know about the results of the Battle of Plassey. But take for example, if someone asks what happened in the Battle of Kalinga, in which the Mauryan famous king Ashoka defeated the kingdom of Kalinga and captured Kalinga. What happened there? How do we know? Take for example the scenario of the Battle of Kalinga. We know about the Battle of Kalinga from a large number of Buddhist texts 
in which Ashoka's life, who was a devout Buddhist, has been described. Ashoka himself, in one of his edicts, gives an account of the terrible tragedies that took place during that bloody war. Now, there are two types of evidence of this battle. How do we look at it? Both are important sources, but what should be the precedence? What should get the precedence for the historian? Here, the case is Ashoka's inscriptions being written in first person, stated by the emperor himself, is a contemporary source. That is, it was written at the command of the emperor Ashoka. It was written when Ashoka was ruling. So there is an advantage that these are clearly contemporary primary sources. The Buddhist tales, which also highlight Ashoka's reign and talk about his annexation of Kalinga, are later in date than the actual period of reign of Ashoka. Interestingly, there is a difference even in the two types of sources we have just mentioned. Ashoka himself indicates that the perpetration of violence left a deep sense of remorse in his mind after the Battle of Kalinga, paving the way for his embracing Buddhism slightly later after the victory over Kalinga. In the Buddhist texts of slightly later date, the conversion of Ashoka to Buddhism is differently explained. The Buddhist text tells us that Ashoka initially was a person of violent disposition, Chandashaka, cruel Ashoka, who killed many of his brothers in order to secure the throne for himself. Once he sat on the throne, he was full of remorse and became a pious ruler under the influence of Buddhism. The transformation of Ashoka the cruel, Chandashaka, to a pious ruler, Dharmashaka, because of the influence of Buddhism. Now the two sets of stories are different, but the inscription of Ashoka being a perfectly contemporary source exactly during the time of Ashoka's reign. And because the inscriptions are stated in the first person, Ashoka himself states that he was full of remorse after the devastations in the Battle of Kalinga. The historian would tend to give greater credence to the statement of Ashoka than to the statement in a Buddhist text of a later period. So this is the way historian tries to work. And therefore, the, for the ancient history, the historian always has to cite the source in order to authenticate the statement the historian is making on the basis of the sources. The historian has to confront a variety of sources and then has to also indicate why and how a particular type of source is being preferred over other sources. So the approach to the sources is directly connected with the methodology of looking at the past that is historical methodology. It also is connected with the question of historiography, that is how the historian looks at the past. What are the questions and issues that lead the historian 
to a particular type of inquiry into the past. We shall look closely into how the historian works with the sources of information. There is, as we now can find out, no single source to understand a particular period of history, no single source to understand a particular situation that developed in a spatial and temporal context. It has to be, but because of the fact that the more remote the period in the past, we only get fragments of information that some authors chose to inform us about. We can also find out why certain authors of the past decided to highlight a particular event of the past and not engage in other events that must have passed during that time. That also is a process of inquiry for the historian. So the sources being simultaneously fragmented and fragmentary in nature, one has to combine the evidence of different types. What long time back Didi Kosambi suggested the combined method of Indology. Kosambi tried to combine textual statements with linguistic and philological analysis and then what is available in written texts needed to be checked, verified, contrasted, supplemented, complemented with field archaeological, ethnographic and visual documentation. Now this is a complex operation. Let us try to look at the preference for sources and the ultimate result that comes across. The discovery of a completely new kind of information can upset or lead to a rejection of the earlier assessment of the past. A typical example of this would be the discovery of the famous Harappan or Indus civilization. We know that the first discovery of the Harappan civilization came around 1921-22. Soon after that, a well-known edited volume on ancient Indian history, namely the Cambridge History of India, volume 1, edited by E.J. Rapson came out. Now when this book was being written, there was no knowledge of the Harappan or the Indus civilization. When the book came out, by that time Harappan civilization is now known through the excavation at Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. So there is a new frontier of knowledge and also a gap in knowledge of the ancient past. Therefore, a supplement to the Cambridge History of India Volume 1 had to be written by a noted archaeologist, in this case Sir Mortimer Wheeler, under the name Indus Civilization, which came out as a supplement to Cambridge History of India Volume 1. This is the result of the sudden discovery of something completely hitherto unknown before. Let us take a look at something else. The noted historian of ancient India, Professor Ramila Thapar, in a well-known survey of early Indian history named History of India, Volume 1, under the well-known Penguin series of non-fiction books, wrote a, a very lucid survey of the pre-1300 Indian history. In that came a chapter 
covering the period from 300 AD to about 650 AD. There, the, the caption of this chapter was towards a classical pattern, towards a classical evolution. 40 years later, the same period in the pen of Professor Ramila Thapar in a new book, Early India from the origins to 1300, the same period is given a different name. The new name is for the same period, 300 to 650 AD, Threshold Times. Now here, the historian's assessment of the same 350 years have undergone considerable modification in the light not only of some new sources but her re-reading, revisiting old known sources of information. Because in the 40 years that elapsed from the first publication to the second publication, Professor Romila Thapar reassesses the known sources with new questions. Therefore, actually the period is revisited with new types of inquiries by Professor Thapar. That's why very elegantly she said the second version of the same book is almost autobiographical because the author's position, author's views have changed over four decades, which is only natural. Therefore, once again, a cardinal principle. The sources are not finite. The sources are not complete. The sources are relatively indefinite, lack of definitiveness in the sources. The sources are fragmentary and therefore requires constant re-evaluation, revisiting, reassessment, and therefore the historian arrives at new explanations of the past. With that, if a un completely unknown evidence, an unknown fact is discovered, then it might lead to a complete overhauling of the assessment of the past. This is how the historians who came across this new inscription had to revise the earlier assessments of the historians of previous generations. What are the different types of sources for the study of ancient India? Moment we talk of sources, our idea is that of written words, texts, inscriptions books of ancient times written in various la ancient languages but we have to keep in mind that in all societies India included there must have been a very long long past in very remote times when there was no literacy in any human history of any part there is a very long pre-literate phase because before literacy uh, surfaced. In fact, the literate past is of a relatively recent phenomenon. The pre-literate past of any human society covers a very long time span, how one looks at it. Because for those parts, there is no written record. There comes in importance of field archaeological sources. What is unearthed from beneath the soil or even from the surface. These are often artifacts, not written objects. And these form the archaeological sources. The broad type of archaeological sources are this. One has field archaeological materials from explored and excavated sites like pottery, like tools, implements made of stone, metal, 
bones, etc. Other uh, archaeological objects like bricks, like terracotta artifacts, all unearthed from the soil. Then archaeological sources for ancient Indian history also include inscriptions, various types of inscriptions from eulogies to small one or two line donative records, long inscriptions in high flown Sanskrit recording the achievements of rulers, then uh, inscriptions recording grants of lands, property transfers. We also have included within field archaeological materials, archaeological sources, coins, coins of different metals, silver, gold, copper, billon, which is actually an alloy, alloyed metal. And then within archaeological sources, we have monuments and visual arts like stupas, chaityas, structural temples and sculptures, sculptures made of stone, made of metal, sculptures made of terracotta and of course paintings. Beyond this archaeological sources, we have textual sources, literary sources and in literary, once again we have two broad subdivisions, indigenous literary texts and non-indigenous literary texts. Indigenous literary texts consists of the vast Vedic corpus. Then we have what may be called the normative texts in which we take the Arthashastra, different types of Dharma Sutras, Dharma Shastras. These lay down the ideals prescriptions, norms, recommendations on institutional history. In the literary sources, we also have very vast body of texts called the Puranas, which record different types of traditions. Puranas are almost uh, encyclopedic in nature and discuss various things, particularly religious sects, rituals, understanding of the past, understanding the historical geography of early India. Then we of course have a very large body of texts on religious activities, rituals and philosophical texts. Among the indigenous texts, we also have some technical literature, not dealing with religious themes per se, but what may be called secular subjects like text on grammar, the famous text of Panini, like a text on medicine, the text prepared by Charaka and Shushruta, the celebrated texts on medicine, surgery, or texts on uh, mathematics, astronomy, astrology, say by Aryabhata, by Brahmagupta, by Barahamihira. So these we also have techni under technical treatises, lexicons, the best example being the Amara Kosha or Namalinganus Hasana, uh, Shasana by Amara Singha, texts written by non-indigenous writers, some of them did visit India and left behind their accounts and impressions of their travels in India. And some did not come to India, but wrote about India, its people, its uh, civilization, the situation in India from derived knowledge. In the non-Indian category of texts, we have the early European accounts like the Greek and Latin texts, the great authors like Herodotus, Megasthenes, the 
Followers of Megasthenes like Orion, Strabo, Diodorus, the geography of Ptolemy, the anonymous author of the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, a very important text for understanding India's seaborne commerce of ancient times. And much later, someone like Marco Polo, who did visit India in the late 13th century. We also have accounts left behind by Chinese travelers, authors who were mostly Buddhist, the famous authors like Fashian, Suan Sang, Yi Jing. More or less close to this category are also the Tibetan accounts, say of Dharmakirti and much later of Lama Taranatha, though it really does not belong to the period of ancient India, but it's important for understanding the history of Buddhism in this country. We also have a large number of texts written in Arabic and Persian language. The authors like Suleiman Al Masudi, the great Al Biruni, a very erudite person of 11th century who lived in India, read about India, mastered Sanskrit, and left his impression about this country. We also have the anonymous text on geography, Hudud al Alam, that devotes a chapter on India. We also have the travel account of the 14th century Moroccan traveler, Ibn Battuta, extremely valuable. And along with that, there can be a completely new type of sources from that part of the globe, that is the uh, Arabic Persian uh, uh, civilizational zone. We also have from 11 to 13, 14th century trade letters, business letters of Jewish merchants who came to India and they left many of their business history in their letters. We shall now try to take into account the more precise exercise on how sources help us in understanding the past, say, the political history of ancient India, social and economic history of ancient India, cultural history of ancient India, how one approaches this different subdiscipline of history and how we combine different types of sources in understanding these facets of the past. It is very likely that in our understanding, say, of political history, we might get conflicting images from different types of sources. How one tries to resolve if two or different types of sources make conflicting claims. We can look at these problems more closely of the use of sources in the subsequent discussions. longer past and if particularly of a very remote past when the historian was definitely not present at the time the events or the developments or the situations of the past are being studied. One has to look for some kind of evidence. The understanding of the past is important 
because what we observe at this moment at present is in fact the result of the accumulation of many events and many experiences that had happened in the past and the understanding today our topic of discussion is on the sources of ancient indian history why the study of the history of ancient india should begin with a discussion on sources why sources are so important for the historian now we have to remember that the subject matter of history concerns past it can be a remote ending of the historical past is often dependent upon some kind of evidence which is available to the historian of the present what is an authentic information what is not an authentic information how to judge it this requires a very special type of professional skill with which the historian must be thoroughly acquainted and fully capable of utilizing those skills that's why the information and the sources of information is so crucial for the understanding of the past the remoter the past greater is the importance of finding out the sources of information about the past let us take an example we all know in 1757 at the battle of plassey the english east india company defeated nawab siraj daulah of bengal and captured power with that began a very major transformation in the history of india when we talk about the battle of plassey it is a, a past of relatively recent past and the documents not past very ancient past it can also be a recent past the historian looks at the past from his or her position at the present for the present times the developments the happenings the incidents are reported almost instantaneously by electronic media by television by newspapers the analysis of news in newspapers in radio what happens if the situation is of a relatively 